Great. So welcome everyone. We're really happy to be here for this event tonight. Um, I'm Katie Richardson. I'm the ELL and dual language coordinator here in Amherst. Um, and I'm really excited to have Diego Sharon, principal of the Amherst Regional Middle School, um, Danielle Thomas, professor in Spanish and linguistics and a panelist of UMass students to talk with us about their experience growing up bilingually and biculturally. So I'm gonna just turn it over to all of you. Thank you, Katie. Um, it seems like Katie froze, so I'm just gonna kind of pick up, but I'm really, as she was saying, grateful to have uh, the panelists and also uh, some of you joining us from the school district. Um, more or less, this is just an opportunity for us to try and reach out to and include more uh, of our community and begin to see one another in this setting and to have the opportunity to uh, talk about and discuss some issues that are really relevant to the young people that we're supporting in our schools. Um, you know, as a principal of the middle school, um, I have uh, the opportunity to see a lot of students all the time who are, uh, of course, bilingual and bicultural. And it's something that I find to be really valuable, uh, a really valuable asset. And it's very difficult uh, sometimes to communicate that to them in a way that allows them to, to really see it and understand it. I um, myself was born in Colombia, uh, and I moved to Los Angeles uh, when I was about five years old. And so I did uh, the entirety of my schooling. Uh, I moved to I moved to LA in August, and I started school in September. Uh, and I knew about three words of English when I showed up, and uh, and uh, you know I was pretty young then, so I remember learning English pretty quickly at that age. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was a blessing that I was able to do that in that, in that way. And, and, uh, uh, but it wasn't easy. And, and I remember, uh, you know, my mom was still a Spanish speaker and she and I lived together. Uh, and so there was a lot of challenges with that, but I really look back fondly on the memories of being, having my home culture in my home and learning about this new culture, uh, that I was being acculturated into um, not so smoothly sometimes, other times more smoothly. Uh, and, and so those are experiences that have really inspired and continue to inspire me uh, throughout my career as an educator uh, and certainly now working in Amherst as a principal. And, and uh, the thought of having this meeting is in part to give students um, who are bicultural and bilingual and their parents uh, an opportunity to see other young people who have, uh, have, have uh, been able to have experiences of their biculturalism and bilingualism and carry those as part of their envisioning for themselves uh, in many diverse ways into their uh, development as adults and in, into their career path and even as to in their aspirations as, as, uh, as you know, as adults. And so, uh, and so, uh, so I'm really proud uh, that we're able to have this meeting and I'm excited for the other individuals on this panel to begin to share a little bit about their story. Um, so maybe Danielle, if you wanna uh, share a little bit about yourself and then we can move on to the, the, the students. Sure, thanks, thanks Diego. So my name is Danielle Thomas. I am a faculty in the uh, unit of Spanish and Portuguese at UMass and my research is in all areas of bilingualism, first starting with language development of children and adults in learning multiple languages at the same time or an additional language later in life. And now um, as I have come to the US, I'm originally Canadian and have lived kind of in different places looking at different types of issues, both in academics and in the private sector. Um, I've had a really great opportunity to see some of the realities in the local context in terms of what people have to be confronted with when they are bilingual or when they are um, living biculturally. My background is that I'm a daughter of immigrants. Uh, my parents came to Canada in the wave of immigration after the First World War when the boats were all leaving Europe and they got on a boat to Canada. And some of my relatives are in the States, some are in Australia, so the boats just went all different directions. 
And so at that time, it was anglicization of everything. Uh, my name Thomas is Thomas, but it's not really Thomas. It's another name, which is Greek. Um, but also my sister and I arrived to adulthood not speaking Greek, even though my parents, that's their first language, and they spoke it in Macedonian actually to each other at home. Um, but they made a concerted effort for us to learn French and English and give up the um, lang family language because it wasn't of any economic importance. Um, and so, of course, we arrived to adulthood, blaming them for our inability to connect with family. So this, I think, it repeats itself over generations. And uh, me arriving in the States, um, I see a lot of issues that um, for Canadians, we obviously deal with, but in a very different way. And I've become really interested and in, kind of dedicated to this idea of Span uh, U.S. as a Spanish-speaking country, and this idea that bilingualism and multilingualism is the foundation um, for most of the world, and it should be for us too. So I'm really happy to be here and be working with the education, um, in the education field more than I have before, and I'm happy to be able to learn from everybody in this environment more about uh, the applied side and the educational side that impact the families and students. So thanks for having me and I'm really excited to hear what all the um, our, our panel have to say today. Um, it's always uh, enriching for me to hear the stories. Oh, so uh, Diego, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. I'll probably do that three more times. Uh, so thank you for prompting me. Uh, I think that's my theme for the past year. Um, so uh, thank you, Danielle, for that introduction. And I'm just gonna go in the order of my Zoom screen and Mildred, if you wouldn't mind, uh, and I said Mildred, but you go by Millie. Uh, so Millie, if you, either one, but if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and, and giving us a little background about yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, Mildred or Millie is fine. So hello everyone, um, I'm a junior at UMass, I'm a biochem major um, and also pursuing a dual degree with Spanish major. Um, I, say, I say this first because I think um, I came into college thinking like, oh, I'm just going to get a minor in Spanish, um, you know, to show that I have some ability in Spanish, like that was my first language, my, I, would only, I only talk Spanish at home. And so then I was confronted with some ideas that advisors gave me like, well, actually, it might be more beneficial for you to get a bigger degree just because it proves to the academic world, um, especially here in America, that you can actually, you have a paper that says you are fluent, even, <laughs> even if you don't think you're fluent. Um, so it made me think a lot about uh, just the dynamic of like having to prove ourselves, even if we are bilingual. Um, I grew up having to prove that I could speak English. I learned to speak English at school, both my parents are immigrants from Guatemala and I would only speak Spanish with them. Um, and yeah, it wasn't until seven years later that my brother was born that I was able to have someone at home to also practice English with. Um, but I, my, both my language and culture have influenced how um, I've been bred up, both in values and then also just how I perceive the world um, and have been exposed to different things. Like I said, being a daughter of immigrant parents definitely pushes you um, and encourages you in a different way um, to view just like the opportunities that you're given. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to be here and like help answer some of the questions. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, so I was born here and I grew up in Lawrence. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Lawrence, but a lot of people, um, especially the, my Caribbean friends have relatives there. Um, but there's also a big portion of Central Americans um, who live there and, and then, that was like mostly me growing up middle school. Um, when I went to high school, it was, I moved the town over, um, predominantly white, so definitely a change. Um, but yeah, I was able to experience both like what my culture meant, like being a Guatemalan, growing up in a, with like people from like Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico and, and also some of the dynamics between those two communities. So it's been very eye-opening um, and yeah, I appreciate just being here. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, you piqued my curiosity when you mentioned the dynamics between those two communities. And I think that's one of the things that is really interesting uh, because us as Latinos, uh, we're a very diverse group and we're not often seen that way. And so 
maybe more about that later, but uh, let's move on and, and hear from Natalie. Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm a Spanish and education major. Um, I always was really interested in language. Well, and my path within language has been very difficult. When, when I was didn't really start speaking any language until I was seven, which was very different. And as Mildred said too, um, I lived in Georgia at the time and they believed it was just because I didn't know English. And it just, and for them, it was just because I was Spanish. And so proving that I do know English, it was just that I was um, diagnosed with autism. And they didn't want to believe it. But as I went through EOSOL classes, and I learned the, both English and Spanish at the same time, they started noticing, which was like my introduction to the EOSOL field, which is where I fell in love and actually found my passion of teaching. And by high school, um, I already was, I guess, a large population of Latinos. <laughs> and with that, I was this Honduran Puerto Rican mix in a really large population of Latinos, but primarily Mexicans. So it was just this mix of words where I had to learn how to talk to one culture and try not to offend the other culture because there's so many words that we have to like try to make sure you speak, I guess, in the right way so you don't offend them or you can actually understand. Like, for example, one time my uncle told me to go buy platanos and I brought those platanos from Puerto Rican, that's what we call them, and he's Mexican, but he meant bananas. And then so that's when I really noticed that there's this really, we need, as like we come in this United States, most people when they think Spanish, it's like this monolingual culture, but it's very dynamic. And we just have to like make sure we understand that diversity within the Spanish culture too. And um, well, as I mentioned before, I grew up in Georgia and then I moved up here, which was a very culture shock for me because there's more Puerto Ricans and Dominicans than there were in the city I grew up in Georgia, which also was another culture change for me. And basically that's where I really started learning about the cultures within Spanish. And that's one time Danielle mentioned in her class that there's no right way of speaking Spanish was really like fit in my heart because just as like a bilingual, sometimes we say the wrong words, that could also is sometimes, that's when I'm, not, I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> but I noticed that there's lots of English words that are in within the Spanish language. And anyway, that's where I really fell in love with the language. And that's why I started majoring Spanish in education. So I can become an ESL teacher. That's my experience with language. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that, Natalie. That's a lot. And, uh, and you know, it's interesting to think about uh, Georgia, which is a place that I've been through briefly driving through, but not spent much time in, and a place where a lot of us have focused a lot of attention over the past few months. Um, but but I think it's, uh, it's an interesting and different perspective to be coming. I was kind of trying to tune myself into a Georgian accent, but I didn't really hear much there. Um, so let's, let's move on. And Christian, uh, why don't you share a little bit about yourself? Can you hear me? Probably speak up just a little bit, um, but yeah. I want to. Perfect. All right. Um, thank you for the opportunity for being here. Um, my name is Christian Luna. I am from social, um, excuse me, from the social region of Massachusetts. Brockton to be more specific, which is about 20 minutes south of Boston. Um, I am a senior marketing major over at the School of Management and also minoring in Spanish. Um, like I said, I was born and raised, born and raised out here. My first experience with um, Spanish was when I ended up living in the Dominican Republic for two years of my life. And um, over there, that's when I completely dropped the English and went full force with the Spanish, which ironically, it, it, was a, it was a difficult situation when I came back to, to the States where everybody was saying, how can you, a, a gringo, right, can lose your English and 
to speak Spanish, right? So, and that, that was difficult in, it, in itself, right? And going to school um, in the bilingual program at it, I was mixed with a whole bunch of like Spanish speakers, you name it, Puerto Rican, Mexican, Ecuadorian, and that, right? There was sort of like a culture shock because I'm so used to the, how do you say it in English? Caribbean, Caribbean Spanish. And I come to the States and it's completely different when everybody has their own dialect, their own specific words, explicit language and stuff like that. That's relatively for us, for their culture specifically, right? And um, no, yeah, so that was basically my experience with the language and yeah. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, and uh, and uh, we might follow up with some other questions a little bit later, but just in the, interest of time, let's go ahead and move along to Alondra. Hi, Alondra. Uh, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and tell us about your background and how you got here. Yeah, so my name is Alondra. I'm from Revere, Massachusetts, so it's also 20 minutes like north of Boston. Um, I was actually born here, but right after I was born, my family moved back to Mexico. So I was there for like the beginning of my life until I was four and then I even went to school over there and everything, but then my family decided to come back. And yeah, so I kind of went into school just knowing Spanish. I didn't know any English and that kind of frustrated me for a little bit. But honestly, that really only lasted for a while. I found that I picked up the language pretty quickly. And then throughout my entire like school life, I was just you know pretty fluent. I never really thought of Spanish to be a bad thing. I grew up in a very diverse community. Um, a lot of Hispanohablantes. There's also a lot of like different cultures, like a lot of um, like North African people, a lot of European people, a lot of mostly Hispanic, a lot of Cambodians as well. Um, and like Vietnamese people and everything. So I never really saw it as like, you know, I never grew up like in a like white prominent neighborhood or anything. So it was never like a bad thing. We all kind of just accepted each other. And that was that. And I didn't really, you know, saw myself as different until I entered college. That was like a culture shock for me. I have never seen so many white people in my life. <laughs> um, I was like, you know, where are all the Hispanic people? Cause like, I have a lot of friends that came to UMass Amherst as well that are from the Dominican Republic, they're Colombian. And it was kind of like, we were our own little group and <laughs> trying to find other people in our community. And it was just very difficult. Like I didn't really see like my people really being represented. And we thought it was very funny when like the school would try to make those like diversity videos and everything. And we're like, where though? <laughs> so I don't know. I just kind of, I never really felt left out of things until I really came here. It's not like people did it on purpose. I just like, you know, you just, you see less and less of your kinds of people. So it's like a different environment. And I just, I don't know. I just felt like I wasn't like truly represented as much as UMass wanted to make it seem like I was. Um, so yeah, that's definitely where I got it. And then here's kind of where I learned more the importance of Spanish. I didn't go in. Oh, and I forget to mention I'm a double major in managerial economics and Spanish. I didn't start off with that double major in Spanish, but then just kind of being in college, like I said, being surrounded by more people, more white people and less people of color, I kind of like realized more the importance of just being Mexican and really having just Spanish be there um, and just being fluent in it. And that was like my goal throughout like the entire time, just because also being in that setting and not being like with my family anymore, which is we only speak Spanish here in my household. I, it's not like I started to lose Spanish, but I just didn't want to risk it at all so I was like I really want to make sure it's solid I have it and I just you know in college I just learned the importance of having that second language and just being really solid with it so yeah <laughs> fantastic thanks for sharing that and and I really love the the different experiences that are come through the students here and and even though there's there's a lot of similarities here and there there's also like really different and dynamic uh things that make them different. And, and, you know, I was thinking like for the students at, at, at the middle school where I teach, uh, you know, UMass is like the local school. A lot of them, uh, the local college, a lot of them have been on campus. A lot of our students, um, you know, ride their bikes through campus and attend events that happen there and, and things like that. Um, and, and so it wasn't like me when I was young, 
never having stepped onto a college campus really until I was much older. Um, but um, but it still is a place that kind of kind of like Alondra said it can be off putting or there's a barrier between how you how the community that you think of as your own and this college thing which is the big towers and the old students and you know and the and the certain looks that, that sometimes get associated with what a college student looks like. Um, I love that we have a panel of of, uh, of college students here that that looks a lot like my family. <laughs> uh, so uh, so I appreciate that. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask um, if and and this is just a question for the panel. So anyone could really answer. I'm wondering what. Uh, because you all shared a little bit about this, but I wonder if there are any specific experiences that you remember growing up that either made you feel kind of more connected to your culture and language or that kind of made you feel concerned about the status of your culture and language in, in relation to the broader community, uh, you know, because those experiences are really important in shaping how we relate to our culture and language. Does anyone want to jump in on that one? Okay, Millie, go ahead. Yeah, I can start us off. Um, yeah, I think something that's so beautiful that has already been mentioned is like the Latin experience is so diverse that we can't just like categorize it into one box. Um, and it's very easy to do, especially in a world where like, or in a society where there's like categories for everything, like you're gonna fit in one list or the other, there's no in between. Um, and I think something that makes us so like, or something beautiful within the Latin community is our complexity, even if we just come from one background because we are now mixing within another background and our culture is being influenced, not just by like who we grew up with um, or the values we grew up in, but also now where do we live? Um, and this changes like from town to town and state by state. So um, I think personally, Rejection came before I was able to embrace. Um, and part of it was because being daughter of immigrant parents, I I grew up with some fears of like not knowing if like my parents would be that cold. Like, or like when there was a lot of talk of like government policies changing. Um, and I think it really uh, pushed me to mature um, in a way that some kids aren't. Um, and it was really interesting because I was able to share these experiences with the students who like also spoke Spanish and came from um, parents who were immigrant, but then also learning how other um, communities within the Latin culture perceive immigrants. Um, because we can also say like, not all Hispanics or Latinos are immigrants. Um, and some people actually be, feel offended for being called either immigrant or we also know like the word Mexican has like a can have a bad connotation um but just like hearing how Alondra also appreciates like her Mexican in the city is beautiful because like it should be appreciated and even within our own Latin community we can sometimes like try to degrade someone um for their own community or where they come um so yeah it was really eye-opening with with I think like I don't know it just makes me think like unity within the Latin community needs to like really be pushed and embraced so that we can as a whole like lift each other up in in a community where predominantly it's white and they categorize us but they don't know all the differences and experiences that we have and as much as my experience is different like I also have a lot to learn from some other experiences of other students so um yeah I really but yeah I guess focusing on the question sorry um yeah I as a daughter of immigrant parents I think I rejected the idea of like I was like, oh yeah, I'm a US citizen. Like there's nothing I have to fear, but no, there are things that come with it. And um, learning to embrace that when like comments were said from even friends who like didn't mean to do it intentionally to hurt me, um, but their perspective was just different on the topic. So definitely, and like, it's not something that's talked about in school. Um, so I think once I came to college and was able to acknowledge and like have words to express like what I'm feeling and knowing other students have gone through this. It's like, okay, I'm not alone. Like this is a thing, I'm not making this up in my head. So I think acknowledgement um, is very important. And like, because we are focusing with like middle school uh, students, um, it's very empowering to give students like words to use and to like 
be able to express themselves um because it's really hard to sometimes share like what you're feeling like there's so many words but you don't know how exactly to incorporate all your experiences in words so or for me that's that was my experience Fantastic. Thanks. That was a lot to share. And I appreciate you doing that. I, uh, you know, I was, I was just thinking that uh, when, so quick little story today, I just happened to bump into someone in a remote setting. So it was safe. We didn't have masks on, but uh, I was in this discussion group and, and he was, uh, he was, um, he was from Gambia, which is in Africa. And, uh, and it turns out that he, I went to, I did my undergraduate degree at UC Irvine in California, and he did his undergraduate degree at UC Davis, but it was like 14 years apart when we graduated, he was a little older than I am. But it turns out that when we did our, when we both were naturalized and sworn, sworn in as US citizens, we were both sworn in by the same person. And so, you know, so here we have these really different experiences, but there's commonalities even between that. But I also wanna point out that on this panel, I've heard people talk or refer to themselves in their community as Lat Latino, Latina, as Hispanic. Uh, someone even said Spanish, even though they're not from Spain. And, uh, and, and so there's a lot of diversity even, and what the term that I haven't heard at all is Latinx, right? And, and, and that's like, the, that's like the, the biggest term in the media right now uh, that's being used. And so I just want to point that out because it's interesting uh, that to talk about like the perception of Latinos versus the lived experience of it. And, and one of the things that I think is really interesting is how the perception, which is in the media and, and, and in the culture is, is really informed, not always by Latinos. Uh, it's often informed uh, through marketing roundtables with people who aren't Latinos. <laughs> and, and, uh, and one of the things that's really power, uh, empowering is that the voices of Latinos are now starting to come to the table. And, and so, you know, here we have a really diverse group of people who are aspiring to become educators and managers and, 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 and uh, executives, and, and they all have this background that's really dynamic. And I'm really excited to know that their voices are going to be in those boardrooms and in those decision-making spaces, uh, and I think that's something that is a uh, that is really opening uh, because you know when when I was in college, I, I remember being asked numerous times like uh, Diego, tell us how this impacts Hispanics, you know, and that kind of thing, and and I felt like I was at a university with twenty thousand undergraduates, and and there were about five hundred of us who were Latino. And so it really did feel like I was isolated a lot of times. And, and even though I'm sure it feels that way to some of you, as some of you were saying, uh, there's still more and more of us in those communities and, and even in, in the principal's office and places like that. So that's really fantastic. I wanna stop talking though, cause I could talk all night, but please uh, someone else share with me about an experience you had growing up that either connected you more to your language and culture or made you feel uh, less connected in, in those ways, uh, if you don't mind. Okay, please, Alondra, thank you. Yeah, I actually wanted to kind of also piggyback with what like uh, Millie was saying. We actually worked together as RAs in like the same cluster and everything. And we were the only Hispanic girls there. So we just naturally gravitated towards each other. And, you know, we definitely like felt connected with each other and talked a lot about like the same conversations we're having now about like um, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx representation and everything. Um, and we always felt also, I feel like when we had conversations uh, um, with our like, kind of like our people, like our other like coworkers, uh, we always felt, um, not that we felt, but we always try to incorporate kind of like our own experience, try to make sure that they were educated about like the Hispanic community, um, letting us know, putting our own input into the situation and kind of like how we thought about things because most of our staff, we did have like other cultures there, but it was mostly like white um, students. So yeah, we always just kind of like try to talk about it and everything. We never felt isolated. They always seemed to want to hear about it, want to know our experiences and everything. Um, 
so yeah I feel like I we definitely didn't feel like isolated but it was like a good thing to have each other and to lean on each other in that like community that we had yeah I mean it's it's uh, it can be difficult to feel isolation in an academic community right uh, uh, one of the things that I that I feel really strongly about is trying to have more adults in the building at the middle school who um, who are Latino, who are African American, who are immigrants, who have these different intersectional experiences, because we have so many students who are looking for uh, adults who they can look up to, who have those kinds of who can who they can empathize with and who can empathize with them. So, so that's that's really uh, wonderful too. I'm going to ask another question, and it doesn't mean that you have to not answer the previous question, but I just want to throw this question out too, because keeping in mind that we're talking to middle school students and their families, I wonder, uh, you know, uh, because you have a lot of lived experience and, and I'd love to hear from those of you who haven't shared as much, but, but what advice would you have for the parents of our students who are trying to encourage them to love their culture, to connect to their culture and to feel secure in who they are and their identity uh, even though it might be difficult for, you know, there's there's always a generation gap, of course, right? Uh, um, I think those of us who are the, the children of immigrants particularly feel that in a in a in a more dramatic way. Uh, but but I'm wondering about, um, you know, what advice you would have for for young for young people, but also for their parents in terms of supporting them through this through these challenging times. Go ahead, Natalie, I know you're thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, um, well, as I grew up in the education system with the majority of Latino students, however, most of the faculty was white and we weren't really allowed to speak Spanish, which really allowed this confusion and this just like, so I don't even know how to explain it. It was just like, we felt so guilty speaking Spanish that we just, didn't want to. And every time we saw someone else speaking Spanish, we just looked down upon them, even though we were Latinos ourselves. So one way to, I feel as like now as I'm older and I'm in college and I see this so much diversity and that there is going to be like more Latino teachers, which is an amazing thing. And more Latino lat educator and diverse de educators. I feel like if more parents also contribute to their talk to their teachers and also get involved in schools and have the schools become more diverse too in a way because as I was teaching um, in Mexico I noticed lots of parents were also very nervous in getting involved with teachers as like our gener as the later generation it's more as if like the teachers are in a higher ground in which I was um, speaking with many teachers in Mexico and, and other teachers in California. It's just this different culture. And if we just, if parents also feel more comfortable, so like get involved in the homework, also trying to bring more diversity events and to just become more inclusive overall, we can just bring this pride that many students, unfortunately, and especially in certain states that, try to down low down make this well, I wouldn't say like down 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 but more try to make it more of my uh, culture that's less diverse and if we can just bring more events to make these different students feel included it would just allow this sense of being able to feel pride in who they are Awesome, thanks for sharing that, Natalie. Um, hey, Christian, we haven't heard from you in a little while. Uh, why don't you uh, take any of those questions that I've, that I've put out there and, and uh, share some of your experience or wisdom with us. So I'm gonna kind of piggyback off what Natalie was saying. It's, it, I'm a firm believer of having parents involved in that. In their kids' education, right? Because education doesn't stop. You know, if you got your home education, which comes from your parents, obviously you got back academia. 
Um, with that being said, I mean, it's just like, if you don't have that education at home, unfortunately, that's what happened to me. My parents weren't involved with my school, and so therefore I was just basically getting a pure education of what I was getting at school, which kind of caused me to re reject my culture a little bit because over here where I'm from, right, it was, um, I want to say it's from first all the way up to middle school where anybody who was a bilingual, they were basically, how can I say, take the, the bilingual, bilingual audio. Like he wasn't allowed to speak Spanish. Um, I got to remember that one time, I, me and my friends, we spoke Spanish, right? And we we got in trouble for it because it was just like, no, no Spanish here. This is complete English. You guys are in America. And from there, that's when I was just like, you know what? I'm, a, I'm born out here. I'm going to do everything out here. So I might as well just like, yeah, I'm, I'm a Dominican, but what is the point of keeping up with the Spanish if I'm going to live out here, work out here, and it's my life out here? So, um, so yeah, it's basically like what I said earlier. It was just like having the parents bring in the education of, when I say education, teaching the rituals, uh, uh, morals, and stuff like that of the culture. Because I mean, you're always going to have the American culture when you're outside of your house, but when you have your 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 actual culture, which whether you're Puerto Rican, uh, Mexican, Dominican, that's what's going to keep your, your identity alive. Having the education at home from your parents. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. That's that's well put. You know, I'm I'm wondering. Uh, um, you you were talking about Christian about how you had your your language and culture kind of devalued at school as a young person. Now that you're a little older uh, and have have lived a little bit longer, do you feel like there is value in your language and culture that you're seeing in society, in the marketplace, and in, in the community? That's that you weren't aware of when you were younger. Absolutely, um, I'll give you a good example right now. Over the years, we're starting to see more of an increase of a uh, minority population. So we're seeing a lot of Ecuadorians, Puerto Ricans, uh, more Dominicans. The Dominicans are coming back, surprisingly, right? And a lot of them do not speak English. So me being a marketing major, obviously, that's one skill that we need is be, being able to connect with our market, right? Which, for example, Brockton is being able to, to speak with others because if you can speak their language, and this is like a business mindset, if you just connect with your customers, they're more likely to connect with you and trust you more, right? So with that being said, that's one aspect of it. And and just the community building piece, right? You, you can build a, a greater, como se dice, um, excuse me, it's just like, the English and the Spanish, all right. Um, you can mix them up, that's fine. Yeah, we can do this, we can do, we can do the Spanglish? Yeah, all right, perfect. Cool. perfect. Um, like I said, como una gran comunidad, me entiende? Que tú tenes, puedes tener una variedad de gente que habla español y es un beneficio, ¿verdad? Porque tú puedes conocer the, the backgrounds of everybody that you come into contact with. So that, that's one benefit with that, the community building and obviously that trust aspect that comes with it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, for those of you uh, who didn't understand that, I think there may be a few. Uh, so what he was saying is just that speaking, being able to speak to someone in their home language creates a different connection. And it, and, it, and particularly uh, as in the, he was talking about in a business sense, but I would just extend that uh, to a broader sense, certainly as an educator, being able to speak to someone in Spanish uh, and speak about things that feel true and real to them is often something really powerful in terms of breaking down some of those barriers that we build up, you know, and, and we've been, we spent a year building all kinds of barriers. We even have masks, uh, you know, that are physical barriers that we wear in public all the time now. And so I think it's really, really powerful whenever you can uh, break some of those barriers down. So thanks for sharing that, Christian. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder if anyone else has, you know, either advice for the parents of young people uh, today, or, or if, you, if you can think back, if there's advice that you would give yourself at, when you were kind of like, if you could go back in time and kind of whisper in your middle school self's ear, like, what would you tell yourself?
I can go as others think. <laughs> um, I, I'll answer your first question, I guess, like on advice for parents. Um, yeah, I encourage you as a parent, I'm not a parent, so I don't know what it means to have a child and the responsibility of like working or just everything you go through and that your mind may go through of like just wanting the best for your child and providing for them. Um, but I can say that I'm so very grateful that my parents taught me Spanish and that my mom mostly and my dad, they both sacrificed. My dad was is like the breadwinner. So he would always be working like two jobs. I would only see him on the weekends. And my mom, who was a teacher and left her job to come here, um, would sit down with me and like teach me grammar in Spanish and just like seeing how important it was for them and how much they valued the, the culture they grew in um, pushed me to want to value it as much as they did um, and I want to appreciate it. So um, I, yeah, I would just encourage you to to even if you grew up here and maybe like your child is like second generation, um, going back to your roots too, um, because it's, I think it can be very easy to want to like foster our child to just um, speak English and like become Americanized, um, but you're actually like taking so much value um, that could be given to them. And, and it can be hard to see it, um, especially if you haven't been told like, like, your experiences are valuable. But if you haven't had the opportunity to like share this with anyone, like I don't think my parents have ever like, I don't know, been on a invited to a panel to just share like what their experience was like. Um, they probably don't really value it as much as I do. But um, yeah, I I think that goes with something I would whisper to myself. Um, I guess like you you're important. Your experiences matter, um, and yeah, like. I don't know, find value in all of your experiences because they are important. I think we can sometimes think they're not important because we don't see the people around us acknowledging them, um, but they are important and they make you who you are. And whether it's good or bad, um, it shapes you. It, so, yeah, I guess. That's right. I mean, it, it, uh, you know, these, like my grandma used to always say, uh, si, si no te mata. <laughs> The endurece, you know, it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger, and so, um, and so that's one of the things that I think uh, there's a lot of value in those experiences that we have, even the challenging ones, like you're saying, Lily. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, what about any anyone else have some advice for their uh, 12 year old, 13 year old self? Go ahead, Alondra. Yeah, I would, when it comes to advice to myself, I would just tell myself to keep doing what I was doing. I was always like a sassy little kid, always embracing my culture. I was like, I'm Mexican, I'm proud. Like every time Mexico won a game, I'd be like, oh, look, Mexico won the soccer game today, telling all the kids and everything. Um, I was always just surrounded by like my core group of friends were Mexican. So we had each other. We were always like very proud of who we were. A lot of the students also in my school, like a lot of Moroccan kids also love soccer. So they were always really happy. They were always like saying it and we were always just talk about it and everything. So I would just tell myself to never like lose that. Like, I think there was a point, you know, when I didn't appreciate as much just because there was even that time, even though I say there was a lot of diversity in my school, there was a time, you know, when knowing Spanish wasn't cool and like, it didn't really matter and whatever. And I definitely went through that. But then later on, that was like a little period. And then when I went in middle school again, you know, I got to gossip with my friends in Spanish. So the other kids didn't know what I was saying and everything. And sometimes they'd be like, you know, they'd say the same remarks like, oh, like you have to speak in English here. And I'd be like, no, I don't. Like, who are you to tell me, you know? Um, so yeah, I would definitely tell myself to just keep embracing it and doing what I was doing. And then when it comes to parents, um, I would give them the advice, like same as Millie, kind of just like tell your kids about your experiences, keep teaching them. I know my mom, she was never the type to be like, oh, you should try to learn more English. Like it was a total opposite. She's like, I'm never going to speak to you in English. I will speak to you in Spanish, like all the way, because she knew that, you know, she always had this saying that in school, they'll teach you English, like you'll learn English there. And she was right because I say that I'm definitely more fluent in English than I am in Spanish. And if she, for some reason, try to change it up or try to talk to me in English, I feel like I would have less of that. And then just seeing this with my own sister, my sister's 12 years old. She 
her Spanish isn't the best. And you know, you kind of just see it as you go by. And I feel like also how many said with like, if you're like second gen, everything like that, you know, you start to lose those roots and you start to kind of lose that like love for your culture. So I say just embrace it as much as you can and definitely give those like members that you have the language to your kids. And I know that I am extremely grateful for all of that that I have, like, and I will always be embracing my Mexican heritage. So, you know, your kids will definitely be proud of it. Even if they aren't now as kids, they will thank you later. Oops, I'm sorry. I, I, Danielle, I wonder because you get to meet so many uh, students uh, who are in, you know, in learn, studying Spanish or, or restudying Spanish, um, how common these stories are? I mean, is this, is this something that's like, wow, this is really different or is it more like typical? Yeah, I would say um, we do have some questions from the, on the chat, but I would say, you know, this is the old story from my generation back and then up to this generation. Um, that as you go through generational, um, pass by generation, the language fl fluency decreases. Um, and this is something that we see, but we don't see it in the Italian community in Canada as much. Because like Alondra pointed out, there was a very, uh, in this particular generational community, very close ties and a very dense community. And so you do see some communities in some parts of the world resisting that because of generational connections, connections with abuela and uh, bisabuelo, or connections among family members that are also diversely distributed across the world, and that they make very specific choices to uh, ensure that the, the consistency of the representation is there. So I, my research was, my original research was in this age group, 20 to 25 year olds, testing their language abilities and then asking, why do you think you speak Spanish at this high level after having been born in Canada and been in this community? And it was pretty, pretty consistent that my parents forced me to. I didn't want to, but my parents forced me to. Uh, and like Alondra said, you may not want to do it at the time, but all consistently of the hundreds I interviewed were grateful at that point to have been had that experience to um, been traveling back home or had those family connections once they hit about 20, 25 years old. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super common, not only in the Spanish speaking community, but across language and heritage and, 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 and uh, language communities all over. And it really takes a, an intentional effort, I think on the part of families and the community, not just families. I think the community has a very large responsibility here, especially if we're gonna, you know, we have 15% Spanish speakers in the United States and 20% that identify as, as uh, Latino or Hispanic. It's a major responsibility socially um, to to maintain that, right, and to and to help celebrate it. Yeah, um, absolutely. They, and Danielle, you mentioned there were some questions in the in the chat. I, I see that. I'm going to read one of them. One yeah. of the questions from Tal was, uh, "How would you uh, like or plan to develop your bilingual or multilingual skills in the future?" This is obviously for the panel. Um, but, but that's a good question. Is that something that you're gonna to continue to work on and develop or, or is, uh, how do you see that? Nothing. Anyone? I think um, the, the way that I'm gonna improve, right? obviously like any other language is practice. Hablar más con mi familia, con mis amigos. And just overall, just talk because this goes with what I would tell my middle school. So that it's okay not to be completely fluent in Spanish or completely fluent in English, and you're not less Latino, you're not less American to not completely know the whole language. And it just takes time. It takes time, like anything else, and it takes practice. And it's just speaking out there. The way I learned wasn't because of my parents but it was more watching novelas, um, going into the community, my friends who taught me. And it wasn't with my family, but it was just out the outdoors, just throwing myself in 
my own community where I was taught myself. And I feel like that's the best way of learning is experiencing it firsthand, practicing it and hearing it and just doing it. Fantastic. Thank, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that. And uh, I'm I'm aware of the time, so we have we still have about ten minutes left, more or less. But I want to get to a couple other questions that that are in the in the chat. Uh, one of the questions is, um, how do you think your perspective on life has been shaped by your bilingualism? And I would just extend that to not only your bilingualism but also being bicultural. Uh, and I think you know, and at least one case, maybe there's like a more than just two cultures there uh, with someone on the panel. Uh, so how, how has that shaped your, your experience of life? I can go. Um, I think as much as culture has impacted, um, that includes your language and your experiences. And with language, you can communicate as like uh, Christian was saying, like, as a business major, like, he has to learn how to communicate, right, and speak with other people to understand their experiences and where they're coming from. So definitely, when you learn a new language, you are learning to communicate in a new way. And then also just being able to communicate with people whose experiences are by nature differently because of their language, and they probably had to grow up speaking that language too and learning. So in that matter, um, yeah, just learning a new language and developing it is what helps you um, kind of develop that like bicultural identity or multicultural. Um, so yeah, I, I think someone else had also asked just to like add on, cause I know we're running out of time. Like the, um, or I think that's the one you asked right now, but how do you think your perspective on life has been shaped by it? And yeah, I think it's like, it has influenced who you have communicated, who you have communicated with. Um, and Plus from that, I think more so, not just your language, but your, your, your mixed identities, um, which is not just like limited to culture, but yes, culture does have a big influence. Um, and someone had mentioned like dominant and minority, which is definitely something that like impacts depending where you grew up. You're, e you're either more aware or less aware um, of certain identities. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because some some people on our panel aren't aren't just Latino. Uh, there's someone who just wrote in the chat that they're Korean and they really appreciate the perspectives because they're going to make sure that they're going to continue to be teaching and using Korean with their kids as a parent. And and I think that's you know something that everyone on the on the panel would absolutely support uh, based on on what we've heard. Uh, and and for me as an educator and as a principal of the school it's really important for me to, to think into how to create welcoming spaces for people to be speaking English, you know, I mean, and Spanish, I'm sorry, and to be speaking their home languages, whatever they are. And I think that's that's something that is kind of a change from what some of you shared, uh, where some of you had gotten in trouble for speaking Spanish uh, at school at various stages of your life. And I think um, that idea of welcoming home languages in the school is, is a really important piece of of what I would like to do and to really not only uh, welcome them and create spaces for them, but also feature them and highlight them. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have, uh, have your voices shared with some of our community members. And I look forward to the time when we might actually be able to be in person and, and have you come to the middle school and, 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 uh, and, and visit students. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, but I uh, really appreciate the panel discussion. I appreciate all of you joining us uh, from the school. And um, I'm really grateful uh, for, the, um, uh, for the opinions and perspectives and, and just all the passion that I heard. And I just want to ask if there's anyone who has, I haven't been able to read, Danielle, all the, all the comments that are coming in. Um, and so if there's anything that you feel like you'd like to share. Uh, Jenny, do you want to share something? I'd like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't react because this is not actually my name. I'm using someone else's account. I'm sorry. I that's okay. my, my name is Elisa Clements, and I'm the facilitator of the Bilingual Parents Advisory Council. And I just wanted to, I could say a lot of, about that, 
organization, you know, why it was created, but one crucial part of its mission is to reinforce the value of the home language. And um, the group is really just getting, becoming cohesive, but I really appreciate all your, uh, specifically the advice for parents. Um, and I will, at our next meeting, I will report the highlights to the group of parents. And I think it will be super valuable coming, specifically coming from your perspective. And this is parents at all levels, elementary, um, middle and high school. And I think the message is valid for all of them. So we're trying to put parent volunteers together with students um, uh, who, who want or need reinforcement of their home language, uh, whether they're working in bilingual clubs or not. So we're really making an effort to get this to happen. Um, but we need to, it's, it's not easy somehow for many parents. And I did have one thought, which is that maybe our name is wrong. We're called bilingual parents, but not all the parents are bilingual. And so maybe some of them are like, well, I'm not a bilingual parent, even though we send the, the invitations out in different languages, even though we say we'll have interpreters. So my guess is we should probably change it to multilingual because then it allows for both speaking several languages and one at a time. But there were a bunch of really interesting points you brought up. One was the fact which I knew of, but that Spanish isn't monolithic. And that guides me in terms of, you know, when we're trying to match um, tutors with, uh, with students who need Spanish reinforcement, hey, maybe we should pay attention to this. You know, it isn't, no, Spanish isn't a monolith, but that hadn't occurred to me because I'm a little bit, I'm outside of that until this moment. So that and other things, um, I, I'm just, really grateful and hope that maybe we can organize a similar event um, as Diego said in person and for other groups because it's it's so important. So thank you. Thank you all for doing this. Thank you for sharing that perspective, Alyssa. And sorry um, I didn't recognize you, but but now I do and I'm and I'm I look forward to being able to collaborate in the future. Uh, and please reach out and we can think into not only the name, but also future uh, opportunities to engage with one another. I wanna really share my heartfelt gratitude for all the panelists who took, gave up their time. Uh, and and I, I don't think you really realize the gift you've offered us. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you, Danielle, for working with us on creating this event. And um, I am also really appreciative of all the parents who took time to listen in and the students who did as well. Um, and so I wish you all a joyous and wonderful. Oh, wait, Julia, do you have your hand up? No, it's a clap. Okay, see, I'm, I'm, I'm missing it. Thank you all for the support and engagement. Wish you all a wonderful rest of the evening. And I look forward to seeing you at some point in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.